next program today will present not only a, a variety of formats, but also a variety of recording and storage me uh, methods. Mike, if you could, uh, this is Mike Valentine, and you're in for a very informative and entertaining. Uh, <laughs> it says here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, don't stop. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Um, it's nice to know that we've got one of the nicest suites here with chairs, so most of you can sit down. I'm sorry for the people that are standing. So, first of all, thank you very much to Nagra uh, for inviting Francoise and myself to come and have a captive audience, which is such fun. In 1972, uh, I joined BBC Television as a sound engineer and worked on all the famous programmes such as... Uh, Monty Python, Faulty Towers, Doctor Who, and had all my sound training then. My relationship with Nagra started in 72, using a little Nagra 3 to go and record sound effects for the uh, Doctor Who series, all these weird sound effects, which was really lovely. Um, we carried on working for the Beeb, having fun, and the last show I did was in 86, uh, which was Live Aid. So I was lucky enough to be on stage during Live Aid, um, doing all the stage mics and everything. The most unbelievable experience. You could put your hand out just a little bit onto the stage and feel the energy from obviously the audience in Wembley, but also from millions of people around the world. It was, it was just an amazing experience. Uh, if you watch the Freddie Mercury film, when the camera goes on stage, there's some people in white, and that one of them was me. But they've got an actor playing me, and they've got this fat guy was here, Charlie, get that. I was young and beautiful. How dare they do that? So I then left in 86 to go and work in the feature film business. Nothing to do with sound. Um, and I became an underwater cameraman. So on the last five James Bond films, I've done all the underwater work, like in Skyfall when he goes under the ice and things like that. Nothing to do with sound. But my heart and my blood still had... Not noughts and ones, boo, but it still had little analog particles inside. And the idea was that Francois and I thought about what could we do to involve ourselves with sound. We were lucky enough to go on holiday uh, to Venice, where we heard the most beautiful music coming from one of the churches. We went in and met the orchestra, Interpreti Veneziani, and they were playing some wonderful Vivaldi. And so we said to them, can we come and record you? And they said, well, okay, do you mind coming for two weeks to work in a monastery to record two CDs for our record label? And we were like, well, I don't know, EastEnders, you know, TV soap is getting good. Cherie was pregnant, I didn't want to leave Britain. So we said, yes, of course we wanted to come and record. So this is the very, very first recording that we made. And it used... What I want to do is I went back to the early 60s and looked at what people were doing when stereo was in its infancy. And one of the approaches they had was to use two omnidirectional microphones, uh, you know, fairly wide apart. Um, Decker started with this idea. Somebody from head office came down to the engineers and said, stereo, fix it. <laughs> So they were investigating this. But they then found that there was a little bit of a hole in the middle. So somebody had the bright idea of put, putting a third microphone in, the, in front of the other two. Now, it looked like a Christmas tree. And when the guy came back from head office and looked at what they'd done, he said, oh, it looks like a bloody Christmas tree. And the Decker tree was so named. So the Decker tree uses three Neumann M50 omnidirectional microphones. And this is the very, using that technique and a Nagra 6, where we recorded the tracks individually so we could mix them down afterwards. This is our very, very first recording. <laughs> Just throw money. 
<laughs> we will pick it up. Any denomination. We don't like Thank you. So we thought, ah, we're on to something. A friend of mine um, said, okay, yes, you can release that as a, a CD, but you should think about records. And I was like, oh, I remember records from years ago. Um, and I thought, you know what, he's absolutely right. But again, because we had, there was no adults uh, in control of me, other than Francoise, my lovely wife, who is enough, um, <laughs> we thought, what about direct cut records? Now, do you remember, I'm sure many of us remember and probably still own a lot of um, things like Sheffield Labs, where they made a direct cut recording amongst many other companies. And what a direct cut is, is in effect using the Neumann, although other lathes can be used, the in our case, the Neumann lathe with the output of the desk, the Neve desk at Air Studios, running up about two flights of stairs into mastering and recorded directly into the grooves. The great advantage is that there seems to be a lot more jump factor, uh, everything sounds a little nicer than the normal way of recording, where in between the lathe and the output of the desk, there may be a digital recording or there may be uh, reel to reel. So we thought, well, let's do a direct cut. And uh, I remember a friend of mine was running the Sid Lawrence Orchestra. So big band jazz would be a lovely subject to use. And we made two albums, a double album and two records. On record one, it's a direct feed on the output of the desk to a 24 track recorder running at 30 inches per second, mixed down to a half inch recorder. So the idea then, that goes onto the lathe. It's an exact same sound because the output of the desk was also feeding the lathe initially to do the direct cut. So we can listen to this album and see and listen and hear is there any difference between a conventional LP in the way it's made and one as a direct cut? So we'll start with the opening um, of the ordinary, what we might call the analog recording. And uh, this is uh, Benny Goodman's Sing, Sing, Sing. And now we'll hear exactly the same microphone set up, the same recording, but taking the tape out of the circuit, if you like, and listening direct as a recording straight onto the record lathe. There, there might be a difference, there might not. It'll be interesting to hear if there are any differences. So my job is not to tell you what to think, but just to take your money. So, but interesting, interesting. The direct cut definitely seems to have just maybe, maybe a little bit more jump factor, high frequencies, a little bit sweeter, a little bit more. I think an American reviewer once coined a fantastic phrase, a bit more there, there. And so direct cut for us seemed to be the way forward. The great disadvantage obviously is that you've got to go to a recording studio which has got um, a fantastic mastering suite or a lathe uh, built into the whole structure. Um, but we still record on location. And I went to visit a, a friend of mine who had a new secretary working away in his office. And she said, oh, hello, I, 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 I've heard that you make recordings. So I was like, you know, trying to be the producer. Yes, sweetheart, I do. What can I do to help you? And she said, oh, would you record me? And I thought, oh, no, oh, almighty, this is somebody's daughter. And you're so talented. Just so I didn't know her from Adam. And I said, OK, I know, I'll slow her down. I said, uh, have you got an accompanist? And she said, oh, yes, somebody will come and play the piano with me. And I thought, oh, OK, you know, come along. There's an X there. Just stand there. Your friend can play the grand piano. We went to um, our local church. Because one of the wonderful things about a church is that it gives you free reverberation. If you're too close to the subject, you may as well be in a studio because there's no character of the room. But if you're too far away, it's a little bit like a swimming pool. So there's a sort of a magic distance 
where you get free reverberation and not in a recording studio. Equipment is getting better, but some of the earlier um, machines that made echo reverberation use very cheap op amps and with that careful pressure signal, you want to try and reduce the amount of equipment in the way. So by going to a church with just two Neumann U47 microphones with a little furry disc separating them to help the stereo, two omnidirectional mics, we put the mics up, Daisy came along, stood there, and um, we thought, hmm, this is going to be interesting, press play, record, and this is what she did for us. <laughs> but um, I thought, oh my, she said, oh, I didn't mention I, I won Classic FM's Most Promising Newcomer Award, I won the Handel Prize, and blah, 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 blah. She was just helping a friend out in that day to type him. Oh my gosh. Uh, 22 years old, uh, a wonderful, wonderful lady, and one of the UK's rising <coughs> talents on the, on the opera uh, scene. Absolutely lovely. So after a few little recordings, we decided to, Mike's ego got out of the lead line box. You're all safe. It's sleeping at the moment. Uh, oh, stay in there. Um, and we thought, let's have a bigger orchestra. So I got hold of a very nice um, conductor who's also a great composer in the UK. And she uh, writes a lot of uh, film music, Debbie Wiseman. And I said, with Debbie, let's work together with the National Symphony Orchestra and we'll make a nice recording and we'll call it maybe, um, I know, a tribute to Spain. So all the usual classic pieces of Spanish themed music were on the LP. But we'll play one little track uh, now because uh, a good friend of ours, Peter Breuniger, um, uses this track a lot at hi-fi shows and so I wanted to play it for Peter because uh, he uses it all the time. It's and beautiful. this is, <laughs> is Habanera with a friend of Daisy uh, singing uh, the the uh, the part of our lady. Wow, <laughs> the the our lovely singist. I don't want to lose you with any musical technical terms. <laughs> lovely singers, um, uh, took French lessons to improve her French diction uh, to record. So, I mean, the, the amount of support we had with this recording uh, was, was wonderful. We decided, Francoise and I, that we would like to go back to Venice to record the orchestra again. Uh, in, uh, they're, in, they're called Interpreti Veneziani um, in the San Vidal Church in Venice. The, the quality of their musicianship is wonderful and the acoustics are very, very interesting. But we thought we'd push the boundaries just a little bit more and let's try this weird stuff which to many recording engineers in studios, not everyone understands that mains cables, speaker cables, interconnects, um, the microphone cables, the power supplies, all can affect the sound. So we decided, with the very kind help of Nordost, uh, to, from the microphone capsule, wire everything that we possibly could with Nordost cable to see if there was a slight difference between using standard uh, Mugami cable that you find in studios, just to see, let's put the audiophile treatment on the recording process to see if, if that helped change anything. So. We went to Venice for five days and recorded uh, the concerts and then asked the musicians which were their favourite takes and then we completely ignored them. No, no, we, <laughs> we listened to, every, to everything they said. And then um, this is one of the recordings that we've chosen to bring to you today. And um, I think the audience did a remarkable job in not coughing and sneezing and making too much noise, considering there's about 400 people in the church. 
So we'll, we'll have a little listen, and this is from our um, Vivaldi and Venice. We've been coming from a classical um, theme today, so we then thought, okay, what's next? Ah, what about some jazz? And we were very lucky uh, to meet a jazz trumpeter, Quentin Collins, and he said, look, I can get a few guys together and we could do a, a live album, a direct cut album in the studio. And I said, oh, oh that would be wonderful. So we have uh, Quentin on trumpet, we have um, a chap playing the drums, who um, used to play with Chick Corea. Uh, our chap on the piano plays with Sting. So we had some really nice people. <laughs> Typical jazz musicians, the drummer turned up at about 10 o'clock. It was only a nine o'clock call, so an hour late, that's not bad. But he wandered and he went, oh, it's, it's very, very hot in the room. So we thought, oh my God, he's drunk, you know. <laughs> so we sort of eased him. He said, where, where, am I, where are the drums? I said. They're those big things with symbols. <laughs> so we sat him down, you know, and, he's like, and it's unbelievable. He just went zip, played perfectly, and after the end of three tracks, he then fell off the track. <laughs> that's, that's another story. Um, but what was so nice of um, our trumpeter, um, <laughs> well, so was many things, but what was so nice for my trumpeter is that he said, look, I'll write three tracks for the album. So we said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. We did three covers and then three tracks. So this is Paxos, anti-Paxos, uh, which was written by our trumpeter, uh, Quentin, and uh, it's quite nice. your claps on to the boys. Thank I'll you bring them up this afternoon. Mike, you did a fantastic presentation today. Ah, oh, you're a thank you. extraordinary this, ha, engineer. Have you met my uncle? <laughs> <laughs> um, Shall I interrupt and have Terry just tell us a little No, that, yes, we'll, I, I will be long. Uh, right. So, um, there's a fantastic recording venue in the northeast corner of Trafalgar Square in London, which is St. Martin in the Fields. It's been there for so long that even Mozart, as a young boy, played at that church. Interesting combination of stone, marble, and, and wood. Um, we got a call at four o'clock one afternoon, and the, a friend of ours said, look, we're doing uh, Beethoven's Fifth, would you like to come and record? So we said, oh, okay, what, what day? He said, no, this evening. Uh, what time? Eight o'clock. I said, it's ten past four. He said, it's up to you. So we had a very quick setup, no time for rehearsal because the audience were coming in. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a nice recording. It's not the best technical quality, um, but it's something of which you would have heard as a member of the public on the day. And this is typical of music that's been played all over the world. And it's so nice to be able to present uh, one of the cornerstones of our composers, Mr. Beethoven, and we'll have the finale of just the uh, symphony of the...